Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit their earliest crimes. Before we talk about the crime, let's talk about the coloring. So this week I have printed out some digital stamps. Um, and I'm going to color them with Copic markers. So I have printed them on Nina Classic Crest Solar White 80 pound cardstock. And I have a, um, a paper pad, like a scrap paper pad, grid paper pad underneath them so that the alcohol ink does not soak down through the paper and then soak back up. If you want to know where I got these digital stamps from, leave me a comment down below and I will be happy to send you a link to that online shop. Okay, um, for the coloring, I am using three or four or sometimes even five shades of colors to get good blends. Um, I am in love with this little girl that's swimming because her hair is fabulous. Anyway, now that we have talked about the coloring, let's talk about the crime and get comfy people because this is a long one. The 14th state in our alphabetical journey is Indiana. Indiana was admitted to the United States as the 19th state on December 11, 1816. Indiana is the first state to have a chapel in its state capital. Indiana is known for its love of basketball and has generated the fifth highest number of professional basketball players per capita of any state. The small town of Santa Claus, Indiana, receives tens of thousands of Christmas letters every year. And Indiana is the final or not so final home to Hell's Bell, the Black Widow of the Midwest one of the most prolific serial killers of the 1800s. Belle Guinness was born Brynhild Paldstetter Dorset in Selbu, Norway on November 11th, 1859 to Paul Peterson Storset, who was a stonemason, and Birgit Oldslatter. She was the youngest of eight children and was confirmed at the Evangelical Lutheran Church in 1874. She was raised on a small farm in Norway and grew up to be a physically very strong woman, standing five feet, nine inches tall and weighing over 200 pounds. An Irish documentary tells a common but unverified story about Belle's early life. The story holds that in 1877, she attended a country dance while she was pregnant. There, she was attacked by a man who kicked her in the abdomen, causing her to miscarry the child. The man, who came from a rich family, was never prosecuted by Norwegian authorities. According to people who knew her, her personality changed markedly. The man who attacked her died shortly afterwards, and his cause of death was said to be stomach cancer. So apparently, even though there's not a lot of, of written history about her early life, this was a pivotal experience and it changed her personality. At the age of 14, having grown up in poverty, she began working for neighborhood farms by milking and herding cattle to save enough money for passage to New York. Bell took service for the next year on a large wealthy farm and served there for three years in order to pay for her trip across the Atlantic. Following the example of a sister, Nellie Larson, who had immigrated to America earlier, Belle moved to the United States in 1881. It was when she was processed by immigration at Castle Garden, her first name was then changed to Belle. Belle traveled from New York to Chicago to join her sister Nellie. In Chicago, while living with her sister and brother-in-law, she worked as a domestic servant, then got a job at a butcher shop cutting up animal carcasses, and she worked there until her first marriage in 1884. Okay, I'm going to freak out all of my family members who are watching this because some of the names of this family are like our family names, and it freaked me out for a minute. But the spelling is different, and they're from Norway, and our ancestors are from Denmark. So... Take a deep breath and relax. <laughs> in 1884, Belle married Mads Albert Sorensen in Chicago on May 7th. Some researchers assert that this marriage produced no offspring. However, however, 
Other investigators report that the couple had four children, Caroline, Axel, Myrtle, and Lucy. Caroline and Axel died as infants from acute colitis, the symptoms of which, nausea, fever, diarrhea, and lower abdominal pain and cramping, are also symptoms of many forms of poisoning. A 1908 article in the New York Times states that two children belonging to Belle and her husband Mads were interred in her plot in Forest Home Cemetery. Cemetery. Sorry, that was a weird way to say that word. On June 13, 1900, Bell and her family were counted on the United States Census in Chicago. The census recorded her as the mother of four children, of whom only two were living, Myrtle, who was three, and Lucy, who was one. A, an adopted 10-year-old girl identified possibly as Morgan but later known as Jenny Olson, was also counted in the household. Two years after Bell and Mads were married, they opened a candy store that was not very successful, and not long afterward, their home and the store mysteriously burned down. The couple collected insurance money and bought a new home. They also had collected insurance policies on their children who had passed away. Neighbors um, often gossiped about the babies because they never saw Bell pregnant. Now, I will say, if she's five foot nine and already a large woman, she may not have been obviously pregnant, but that's still kind of weird. I don't know. On July 30th, 1900, Mads died on the day that his two life insurance policies overlapped. So one was about to expire and the next one was about to begin and there was a one day overlap. The first doctor to see him thought he suffered from strychnine poisoning Another doctor thought maybe he had a cerebral hemorrhage, but his family doctor had been treating him for an enlarged heart, and he concluded that the death had been caused by heart failure. An autopsy was considered unnecessary because the family doctor said that his death was not suspicious. However, his family demanded an inquiry, claiming that Bell had poisoned her husband to, cl to collect on the insurance but no charges were filed. In the end, she was awarded $8,500, which today is almost $300,000. And again, she collected this money on the one day where she could collect both policies. With the money she collected after her husband Mad's death, she purchased a pig farm on the outskirts of Laporte, Indiana. As Bo was preparing to move from Chicago to Laporte, she became reacquainted with a recent widower named Peter Guinness, also from Norway. Peter was a butcher by profession, and Bell married um, Peter and Bell were married in Laporte on April 1st, 1902. The following week, while Peter was out of the house, his infant daughter from his first marriage died of an unknown cause in while in Bell's care. Peter then died eight months later due to a skull injury. Bell explained that Peter reached for something on a high shelf and a meat grinder fell on him, smashing his skull. Local people refused to believe that her husband could be so clumsy. He had run a hog farm on the property and was well known to be an experienced butcher. Another person seemed to be catching on to Bell's habits. Her foster or adopted daughter, Jenny, yeah, she was heard to be saying to schoolmates, my mama killed my papa. She hit him with a meat cleaver and he died. Don't tell a soul. The district coroner reviewed the case, unequivocally announced that it had been a murder and conveyed a, a coroner's jury to look into the matter. And Jenny was brought before this, this um, in, um, inquiry, but denied having made that remark. Bell successfully convinced the investigators that she was innocent of any wrongdoing. She then collected $3,000 more in insurance money for Peter's death. At the time of this inquiry, she did not mention that she was pregnant, despite the possibility that it might have inspired sympathy. And in May of 1903, she gave birth to her um, to a son named Philip. Now, in everything else that I read about the story, Philip's name is not ever mentioned again. Okay, weird. 
In late 1906, Belle told neighbors that her foster daughter or adopted daughter, Jenny, had gone away to a Lutheran college in Los Angeles. Other neighbors were informed that it was a finishing school for young ladies. In fact, Jenny's body would later be found buried in the hog pen. A year after that, Peter's brother, Gust, took Peter's older daughter, surviving daughter from his first marriage, to Wisconsin. And she is the only child to have survived living with Belle. That's kind of freaky and weird. Between 1903 and 1906, Belle continued to run her farm. In 1907, Belle employed a single farmhand. His name was Ray Lampier to help with the chores. Word soon spread that her relationship with Ray was more than strictly professional. When drinking, he often boasted of sleeping with his employer, which came as a surprise to those who only saw Belle as a burly woman who liked to dress in men's overalls and do her own hog butchering. Eventually, though, Ray would not be enough for Belle. She wanted something more and soon began to look for new suitors by inserting the following advertisement in Love Lorn in the Love Lorn, Love Lorn Oh my goodness column of newspapers in large Midwestern cities. And here is what her ad said. Humley Widow, who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in LaPorte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with the view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow the answer with a personal visit. Triflers need not apply. So she's looking for herself a rich man. Several middle-aged men responded to Belle's ads, and with no, within no time, Belle was seen often going for carriage rides with strangers on Sunday afternoons. She was wearing the finest clothing on her carriage rides. Her hair was adorned in the latest style, and she was usually accompanied by handsome men. Um, most of the men were unrecognizable or not known to the people in town, and she was not recognizable as this farm woman who butchered her own hogs. She just was not the same person that they were used to seeing. In 1905, one of her ads was answered by a Wisconsin farmhand named Henry Gerholt. And after traveling to Laporte, Henry wrote his family saying that he liked the farm, was in good health, and requested that they send him seed potatoes. When they failed to hear from him after that, the family contacted Belle and she told him that Henry had gone off with horse traders to Chicago, but she kept his trunk and his um, fur overcoat. Joe, or sorry, John Moe of Minnesota answered Bell's ad in 1906. After they corresponded for several months, Moe traveled to Laporte and withdrew a large sum of cash, more than $1,000, to pay off her mortgage on the farm. Or at least that's what he told neighbors when he was um, there in town. Belle introduced him as her cousin, and he disappeared from her farm within a week of his arrival. And although no one ever saw Mo again, a carpenter who did occasional work for, Mo, for Belle observed that Mo's trunk was still in her house, along with more than a dozen others. The next man was a man named George Anderson from Missouri, and who, like Peter, her former husband and John were immigrants from Norway. During dinner with George, Belle raised the issue of her mortgage and George agreed that he would pay this off if they decided to wed. Except that what's his name already paid her mortgage off, right? I'm just saying. Um, late that night, George woke to see her standing over him holding a candle in her hand and with a strange sinister expression on her face. Then, without uttering a word, she ran from the room. George fled the house and took a train back to Missouri. Um, the suitors kept coming, but none of them except for George ever left Bell's farm. None of them were ever heard from again. By this time, she had begun ordering huge trunks to be delivered to her home, and the hack driver named Clyde delivered uh, many trunks um, from her home in Laporte, and later remarked how this woman would lift these enormous trunks like boxes of marshmallows, tossing them onto her wide shoulders and carrying them 
into the house. She also kept the shutters of her house closed day and night, and farmers traveling past the dwelling at night saw her digging in the hog pen. Um, Ole B. Budsbird uh, was an elderly widow from Wisconsin, and he was next on the scene. He was last seen alive at the Laporte Savings Bank on April 6, 1907, when he mortgaged his Wisconsin land, signing over a deed and obtaining several thousand dollars in cash. Ole's sons, Oscar and Matthew, had no idea that their father had gone off to, pay, um, to visit Belle. When they finally discovered his destination, they wrote to her and she promptly responded saying she had never seen their father. Several other middle-aged men appeared and disappeared in, pre in brief sorry, visits to the farm throughout 1907. Then, in 1907, Andrew Helligan, I'm probably butchering that name, was a bachelor farmer from Aberdeen, South Dakota, and he wrote to her and was warmly received. The pair exchanged many letters until a letter that overwhelmed Andrew, written in Bell's own careful handwriting, and dated January 13, 1908. This, this letter was later found at Andrew's farm, and this is what it read. To the dearest friend in the world, no woman in the world is happier than I am. I know that you are now come to me to, and, be, and be my own. I can tell from your letters that you are the man I want. It does not take one long to tell when a person when to like a person, and you, and you I like better than anyone in the world I know. Think how we will enjoy each other's company. You, the sweetest man in the whole world, we will be alone with each other. Can you conceive of anything nicer? I think of you constantly when I hear your name mentioned, and this is when one of the dear children speaks of you, or I hear of myself humming it with the words of an old love song. It is beautiful music to my ears. My heart beats in wild rapture for you. My Andrew, I love you. Come prepare to stay forever. So she is laying out all the flattery things, right? In response to her letter, Andrew flew to her side, not literally flying, he, tried, he went on train, in 1908, and he had with him a check for $2,900, his life savings, which he had drawn from his local bank. A few days after he arrived, he and Belle appeared in, at the savings bank in Laporte and deposited the check. Andrew vanished a few days later, but Belle appeared at the savings bank to make a $500 deposit and another deposit of $700 in the state bank. And this was about the time she started having problems with Ray, her hired hand. Now remember that Ray claimed that they had a less than strictly professional relationship. And he claimed he was deeply in love with her. He would perform any chore for her, no matter how gruesome. And he became jealous of the many men who arrived to court her and began to make scenes. So she fired him on February 3rd, 1908. Shortly after firing him, she presented herself at the courthouse and she declared that her former employee was not in his right mind and was a menace to the public. She somehow convinced the local authorities to hold a sanity hearing. Ray was pronounced sane and released, and Bell was back a few days later to complain to the sheriff that he had visited her farm and argued with her, and she contended that he posed a threat to her family and had him arrested for trespassing. So Ray returned again and again to see her, but she drove him away. He made thinly disguised threats, and on one occasion, he confided in another farmer that Andrew won't bother me no more. We fixed him for keeps. Andrew had long since disappeared from the precincts of Laporte, or so it was believed. However, his brother, I, Asley, Asley, was disturbed when Andrew failed to return home, and he wrote to Bell in Indiana asking her about his brother's whereabouts. Bell wrote back telling Asley that his brother was not at her farm and probably went to Norway to visit relatives. Now his brother wrote back saying he did not believe that Andrew would do that. Moreover, he believed that Andrew was still in the Laporte area, the last place he had been seen or had been heard from. 
Belle brazened it out. She told him that if he wanted to come and look for his brother, she would help him conduct a search, but she cautioned him that searching for missing persons was an expensive proposition, and if she were to be involved in such a manhunt, he would have to be prepared to pay her for her efforts. So Asley did come to Laporte, but not until that next May. Um, Ray... Um, began to represent an unresolved danger to Belle. And now Andrew's brother, Asley, was making inquiries that could very well send her to the gallows. So she told a lawyer in Laporte, a Mr. M. E. Letelier, that she feared for her life and that of her children. Ray, she said that Ray had threatened to kill her and burn her house down. And she wanted to make out a will in case he went through with his threats. The attorney compli complied and drew up her will, and she left her entire estate to her children and then departed his offices. Then she went to one of the Laporte banks, holding the mortgage for her property, and paid it off. She did not go to the police to tell them about Ray's allegedly life-threatening conduct, though. The reason for this, most people concluded later, was that there had been no threats. She was merely setting the stage. In March 1908, Bell sent several letters to a farmer and a horse dealer in Topeka, Kansas, inviting him to visit her. He decided to put off the visit until spring and did not return before a fire broke out of her farm. Bell was also in correspondence with a man from Arkansas and sent him a letter dated May 4th. And he was coming to visit her, but also did not make it there before a fire broke out of her farm, or before this fire at her farm. Um, Belle allegedly promised marriage to a man named Bert Albert, but then backed out of it because he was not wealthy enough. In 1908, just as Andrew's brothers was becoming super suspicious, I mean, he was already suspicious, but he was really starting to um, look into things. Belle's luck seemed to be running out, and her farmhouse burnt to the ground. In Now, this is the second business home she's had that's burned down. Keep that in mind. In the smoldering ruins, workmen discovered four skeletons. Three were identified as her foster children, or her children, rather, sorry. However, the fourth was believed to be, to be Belle, but the body was missing its skull. After the fire, her victims were unearthed from their shallow graves around the farm. Police began a search of the property and dug up dozens of graves. Not just Andrew, but the remains of one victim after another. Most of the remains on the property could not be identified. Because of the crude recovery methods, the exact number of individuals unearthed on the farm is unknown. But 14 of Belle's victims were pieced together with several teeth, bones, and watches left over. Left over. In all, the number of murdered victims was estimated to be as many as 40. What they found was a graveyard for murder victims, and newspapers began calling her Bluebeard in skirts. Okay, here's where things get even weirder. Railroads ran special excursions to Bell's farm, bringing morbidly curious sightseers with the hope of catching a glimpse of police pulling out body parts. As many as 15,000 people arrived in a single day. And if that's not bad enough, refreshment stands were set up all along the road, all along the road serving Guinness stew. Oh my gross. Ray was arrested for murder and arson on May 22nd, 1908, and was found guilty of arson, but cleared of murder. He died in prison, but not before revealing the truth about Belle and her crimes, including the burning down of her own house. The body that was recovered was not hers, at least according to Ray. His story is that the headless female corpse found in the smoking ruins of Belle's home was a woman who had been lured from Chicago under the pretense of being hired as a housekeeper only days before she decided to make her permanent escape from the port. According to Ray, 
Bell had drugged the woman, bashed in her head. Once she was dead, she took the corpse to the basement, put her in her own clothing. Bell took out her false teeth and placed them next to the headless corpse to make sure that it would be identified as Bell. Apparently, she had some really fancy false teeth. She then chloroformed her children, smothered them, and carried them into the basement, then torched the brick farmhouse and fled. Ray was supposed to wait at a designated place on the road after the fire was set, but Belle never showed up. Instead, she left town cutting across an open field and disappeared into the woods. According to Ray, Belle had planned the entire thing and skipped town after withdrawing most of her money from her bank account. She was never tracked down, and her death has never been confirmed. Whether or not Belle truly died in that fire that claimed the lives of her children, whether she escaped into the ether or some other fate befell, befell her remains unclear. What is certain is that April 28, 1908 was the last anyone ever heard from her. Alleged sightings of Belle were reported for years. In 2008, a forensics team from the University of Indianapolis, led by forensic anthropologists, exhumed the remains in Bell's coffin. They had hoped to use the DNA from a letter she sent one of the victims and prove that Bell had either died or not died in the fire. But because of its age, it was not, there was no viable DNA um, found. In 1931, a woman using the name Esther Carlson was awaiting trial in Los Angeles, accused of poisoning a man to collect his life insurance money when she died. Carson reportedly had an uncanny resemblance to Belle. What's more, she was roughly the same age that Belle would have been had she, had she not died in the fire, and her MO was consistent with Belle's. So whether or not Carlson was actually Belle is unclear. Um, but 1931 marked the last time anybody ever reported seeing Belle. And so she would have been about 72 years old at that time. The Legends of America link in the description box below has a list of suspected victims if you're interested. I have a couple of pictures. This is a young picture of Belle. Then I have a picture of Belle with some of her children. Um, I don't... The picture didn't say which children. I also have a picture of Belle at a, about the age she would have been when she died slash disappeared. I also found a picture of the remains of her home after the fire and huge amounts of people standing around staring at this gruesome scene. So thank you so much for stopping by my channel for another true crime video, true crime story. I've added a couple of other videos here for you to watch. Also, a subscribe button if you have not yet subscribed to my channel. I would love it if you did so. And leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment, and have a great day.